presentation slide. Did you receive it, Mr. Kimmich? No, not yet. Okay. Okay, now it's uh, uh, 3 p.m. now, so let's start uh, our webinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and uh, friends, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. My name is Keping Yao. I'm the senior governance and public administration expert of UNPOG, DPIDG of UNDESA. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Capacity Development Webinar to launch the toolkit on capacities for digital government transformation. This webinar is co-organized by UNPOC of UNDESA and the ICT and Disaster Risk Reduction Division of UNSCAP. The toolkit has been developed on the basis of the 2020 and 2022 editions of the UN e-government survey with extensive desk research on country cases. The toolkit is available on both OnPan and OnPoc websites. So now I would like to invite Mr. Kichong Ko, head of OnPoc, to deliver his opening remarks. Mr. Ko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Keping. Good afternoon, evening, and morning. Ms. Tijera Bonapas, Director ICT and Digital Risk Reduction Division, UNSCAP. Distinguished participants and partners, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to this capacity development webinar to launch the toolkit on capacity for digital government transformation. UNPOG, which is the part of the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, is mandated to strengthen public governance capacities of developing member states, especially third countries in special situations in Asia and the Pacific and beyond to achieve the 2030 agenda. One priority area of our work is to support developing countries in strengthening their capacities for digital government transformation to achieve a sustainable development. In today's world, while many countries are taking measures to accelerate the pace of digital government transformation to address complex challenges for realizing the 2030 agenda, many of them remain ill-equipped and are co confronted with a multitude of challenges in techno technological governance and institutional dimensions. In this context, DPIDG UNPOC developed a toolkit on capacity for digital government transformation to support member states in their endeavors to develop capacities, explore solutions to overcome challenges, and advance digital government transformation. This training of a trainer's capacity development toolkit is, is structured around the modules that include readings, self-assessment situation analysis, application of theories to concrete, to concrete issues, priority setting exercise, country case studies, action planning, and other activities. The toolkit provides methodologies 
and approaches to developing capacities at the institutional, organizational, individual, and societal levels to drive digital government transformation. It puts particular emphasis on developing digital capacities of people in vulnerable situations to promote digital inclusion through reaching the digital divide. Moreover, the toolkit underscores the importance of adopt, adopting a holistic approach, fostering challenge, changing mindset of the public sector and creating safe spaces for individuals to innovate. I am pleased to inform you the toolkit is made freely available on the OnPan website. This toolkit is also intended for schools of public administration and institutions of public management, given their strategic role in training public servants and the education of the society in general for digital government transformation. It is my wish you could explore the opportunity to adopt and implement the toolkit to your national context. Ladies and gentlemen, strengthening digital cooperation among countries is key for the fast-tracking digital government transformation of developing countries. I believe this webinar could provide a timely and unique platform to share knowledge and exchange good practices to support the capacity building of developing countries in advancing digital government transformation. Taking this opportunity, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to UN ESCAP for the continued partnership and collaboration in promoting digital transformation in, the, in Asia and the Pacific. I wish you were a successful webinar with fruitful discussions. Thank you for kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ko, uh, for delivering our inside of us, uh, opening speech with a snapshot of the toolkit, the expected impact of the toolkit, and the importance of strengthening digital cooperation in the region. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Tiziana uh, Bonapes, uh, Director, ICT and a Disaster Risk Reduction Division, UNSCAP, to deliver her opening remarks. Ms. Tiziana, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, uh, moderator for today. Um, a very good morning and good afternoon to all the distinguished participants, uh, esteemed colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to have this opportunity to address you at the opening session of this webinar. And at the outset, I would like to extend my special thanks uh, to Mr. Ko, the head of AMPAUG, uh, for the preparation of this event and for inviting ESCAP to partner with you. Um, as we navigate the shifting landscapes of our time, shaped by rapid digital transformations, the pressing challenges of climate change, socioeconomic disparities, global health crises. There are many, many problems. Um, the role of digital government in driving sustainable development becomes crucial. The rapid advancement of digital technologies has and is continuing to transform how governments operate and how they interact with their business sectors and their citizens. Digital governments have the potential to enhance public service deliver delivery. They have the opportunity to promote greater transparency, to foster innovation, and ultimately to contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. Um, digital advances also make 
uh, digital government more complicated uh, because people have the means to demand more from governments. And so it is really about a two-way conversation and dialogue between governments and their citizens. Um, and so we see that government, the delivery of digital government um, has really become more demand driven. Uh, likewise in ESCAP, uh, to respond to the changing demands of our member states, uh, we have been collaborating very closely with our members to promote digital cooperation and accelerate digital transformation through the operationalization of our Asia Pacific Information Superhighway Action Plan, which runs from 2022 to 2026. And under the framework of this action plan, uh, I'm very pleased to inform you that ESCAP and the Ministry of Science and ICT of the Republic of Korea co-organized the first Asia Pacific Digital Ministerial Conference in Korea on 10 November last year. I'm also very pleased to inform you that the second ministerial conference will be co-organized and hosted by the government of Kazakhstan in Astana in October 2024 and uh, this ministerial conference will be co-organized with ESCAP. And it's important, um, the regular holding of ministerial conferences we view as being, as being very important. And likewise, elevating digital public services to the highest ministerial decision-making level assumes a significance because ministerial decisions provide the momentum and the common vision. And so we are hoping to have the opportunity to work together with AMPOG, and we are hoping that digital government will feature prominently at the next ministerial conference to be hosted in Kazakhstan uh, next year. So once again, I would like to thank Mr. Ko and his colleagues for the partnership with ESCAP. We do need to work together and ESCAP is uh, very pleased to see that this event really provides a unique platform for stakeholders from across the region to share experiences, best practices and lessons learned. Um, by fostering dialogue and cooperation, we can collectively build a more inclusive, resilient and sustainable future. And before ending, I would like to express my gratitude to all participants uh, for your uh, interest, for your active uh, involvement. Um, and I am sure that uh, through our joint work, we can uh, move forward and we can continue to deepen collaboration, leveraging on our shared resources and expertise uh, to bring the benefits of digital transformation and government innovation to all. And I would also like to thank our colleagues from DESA, in particular Vincenzo Aquaro, the director, for the instrumental um, partnership that we have forged together and uh, for uh, working closely with ESCAP uh, towards our common objective of bringing frontier technology policy experimentation and regulatory sandboxes, a development account project uh, to fruition in Asia and the Pacific. So thank you very much and looking forward to the outcome of this meeting and wishing you all success.
Thank you, uh, Tiziana, for delivering so inspiring uh, opening remarks. You highlighted the role of a digital government in driving sustainable development and the importance of a digital cooperation for a digitally inclusive Asia Pacific. Yeah. So before I pass the floor to my colleague uh, of the session one, may I ask uh, all participants here, please kindly open your video so that we can have a group of photo. Uh, please understand that uh, I have a 13 screen so that my colleague will take uh, a few minutes, uh, one or two minutes to take a picture for all of you. So please keep your smiling for a few uh, times so that, uh, yeah. So um, Carrie and Changi and uh, Haley, can you do the um, shooting of the videos now? Then you also let us know when it's done. Can we start now, Carrie? Smile, everybody. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Carrie. So now I'd like to uh, um, move the floor, uh, move to the session one on recent trends in digital government transformation. And my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Yun Suk Lee, senior program management expert of, on POC, he, she will be the moderator for this session. Ms. Lee, you have the floor. Good afternoon, team learning your participants. My name is Yun Suk Lee. It is my pleasure to moderate session one and recent trends in digital government transformation, challenges, approaches, and strategies, and required competencies of government officials. First, I would like to invite Mika Akparo Zinsanto, Chief of Digital Government and um, Chief of Digital Government Branch, DPIDG UNDESA. It is a time difference in New York. His presentation will be delivered in video. Let's take a look. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, in my presentation, I will share key findings of the United Nations Government Survey 2022, the leading global assessment of the digital government landscape across all 193 member states of the United Nations. The survey ranks how countries perform when it comes to delivering digital services and engaging people online in public affairs. For whom is not familiar with the survey methodology, it is based on a quantitative composite index called the AGDI Development Index or AGDI. The AGDI is organizing four main groups, very high, high, middle, and low AGDI, further divided in 12 different rating classes. At a glance, the 2022 AGDI shows an improvement in global trends with the transitioning of many countries from lower to higher AGDI groups. Comparing with the, the previous edition, the number of countries in the very high and high AGDI groups slightly increased and consequently, the middle and low GDI groups decline. More than two thirds of the countries are now in the high or very high GDI group, with only seven countries remaining in the low GDI. Overall, the upward trend is encouraging, but while we observed widespread reliance on digital technologies for services delivery during the COVID-19, the global average GDI raised slightly in 2022 and less than general expectations. Data evidence shows how digital transformation has not yet materialized in a more homogeneous and comprehensive manner, especially for developing countries. At the regional level, Europe continues to remain for the 12th time the leader region, followed by Asia, the Americas, Oceania, and Africa. 
Based on 2022 data, 15 countries are the world leading countries with the highest rating class in the group of very high GDI. Those countries are quite similar for level of digital development. In this group, all the regions are represented but Africa, with eight countries from Europe, four from Asia, two from Oceania, and one from Americas. Interesting to note that UAE and Malta are the new entries in the group of leading countries in the world. At regional level, Asia improves its performance, increasing its average GDI value from 0 0.57 in 2018 to 0 0.64 in 2022, becoming the second most advanced region in e-government development. Republic of Korea, Singapore, UAE, and Japan are the leaders in the region and are also part of the world-leading countries with the highest rating class, very age. 15 countries are in the very age GDI, with Georgia moving up from high to very high. 22 countries are in the high GDI, with Lebanon, Nepal, Tajikistan moving up from middle to high. 10 are in the middle AGDI and no country is in the low AGDI. Digitalization trends are positive overall in line with the global trends, with more than half of the countries have improved their AGDI ranking in 2022. Although the level of the government development among individual countries in the region remains highly diverse, with wide variance in AGDI value and ranking. For developing countries, the path to digital inclusion and sustainable development remain fraught with obstacles and uncertainties. Despite investment in technologies and the development gains achieved in many countries, the digital divide persists and for some group of countries increase. Ongoing challenges continue to undermine the development efforts of countries in special situations, especially the least developed countries, as clearly shown in this map. Using the global average GDI as a proxy for measuring the digital divide, the 2022 survey indicates that about 45% of the combined world population, 3.5 billion people, still lags behind. In Africa, for example, 50 out of 54 countries have a GDI value below the global average, and the same is true for 11 of the 12 seats in Oceania. The digital divide is now the new phase of inequality, and the global community needs to take action to leave no one behind. In digital transformation, the primary objective should be recognizing human agency and supporting human development through digitalization, as the future will be still hybrid and not only digital. Therefore, the future should be an inclusive, integrated, analog digital ecosystem that must ensure no one is left behind. And digital government should work always as an equalizer for inclusion. To do so, a whole of government approach that integrates multi-level multi-sectorial and multidisciplinary strategies is needed starting from the principle of inclusion by design or inclusion first before doing digital by design. More member states are developing cutting-edge technologies such as cloud computing, artificial intelligence and blockchain. Some have developed new methods for exploiting data-driven policy modeling tools and have created pilot initiatives and sandboxes to design, validate, and scale up innovation solutions. New approaches are strengthening member state analytical and anticipatory capabilities and are shaping future development scenarios. Governments are setting themselves up to better anticipate and respond to the needs of all members of society. Looking at the future, the survey indicates that a growing number of countries are moving toward seamless, invisible government in which fully automated and personalized services are made accessible to anyone, anytime, from anywhere, using cutting-edge technologies. 
innovation and digital transformation must always aim to be truly inclusive. But the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development should remain the government blueprint for building an healthier and more resilient and inclusive future and leaving no one behind should become the operational principle for the future, guiding digital development and making e-government as a force for good. Thank you for your attention. I would like to thank Mr. Aquaro for a comprehensive overview on the global trends and regional snapshots and key findings from the UN e-government survey 2022, highlighting important policy issues, including global digital divide and innovation for the future of digital government. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Song Ji Song, Director of Digital Government Cooperation Division, Ministry of the Interior and Safety in the Republic of Korea, to deliver a presentation on Korea's journey towards digital platform government. Mr. Sun, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's, it's my honor and pleasure to deliver this presentation about the recent updates of Korea's digital government today. Next slide, please. Um, it has been more than 50 years since the beginning of digital government in Korea. Over these years, we developed many national strategies and initiatives for digital transformation of the public sector. The most recent one is the Digital Platform Government Initiative, which was announced in May 2022. Uh, and the Presidential Committee on Digital Platform Government also established in, was established in September 2022. Next slide, please. Um, this slide summarizes the development of Korea's digital government, especially in terms of self-delivery and data sharing. We started with separated individual services only for specific functions like resident registration, vehicle registration, and land registration, and etc. There was no data sharing among services then. And then we developed integrated services for each policy area. The services could be accessed at an integrated web portal of each ministry. Data sharing was mostly limited within the same organization. Upon the development and proliferation of these services, uh, the Korean government started the whole of government's first services, such as gov.kr and data.kr, in 2010. Through these services, people can find and apply for services of all government ministries and agencies more easily. Citizen center services, such as live event services, were started at this stage and data sharing among different government entities has become inevitable. Nowadays, the Korean government has been developing personalized services in multiple channels in cooperation with the private sector. Next slide, please. Um, before we go deeper into the digital platform government, I would like to share Korea's effort to strengthen capacities of officials and organizations for digital transformation. There are many digital skill training courses for government officials in Korea. Hundreds of online and offline courses are offered by various institutes, and officials can take the most of them for free. All officials are required to take the designated number of credits according to their position and duty. For a couple of decades, Korean government established a separate master plan for digital capacity development of our officials, but since 2016, as most officials already have some level of digital competency, the master plan has been integrated into the general human resource development plan, which is established by Korea's National Human Resource Development Institute annually. National digital skill contest and award from 1994 until 2015 encouraged officials to develop their digital capabilities. Officials were awarded with cash prize and additional credit for promotion. But for the same reason with the math plan, the national contest was closed in 2016. Next slide, please. At organizational level, the most important foundation uh, is legal obligations and mandatory missions based on strong rule of law. 
For example, the e-government act states the legal obligation of government organizations to make the most use of digital technologies in order to provide better services for citizens. We also have an evaluation system in place to continuously check and encourage all organizations to comply with these obligations. Each organization receives incentives or penalties based on the results. Systematic management of each organization's project is also very important for a successful and efficient digital transformation from a whole of government perspective. The Digital Government Bureau of the Korean government operates project management systems such as preliminary review and prior consultation in accordance with e-government performance management guidelines. With these systems, we minimize duplications and overlaps among projects and ensure the compliance of projects. The Bureau also offers financial and technical support for new digital transformation projects and data utilization as well. Next slide, please. Um, despite Korea's advancement in digital government services, there are still many issues that need to be addressed. Many citizens are missing out on benefits or giving up on them because the services are not user-friendly or proactive enough. Organizational silos, silos and outdated regulations are still blocking the way to database decision making. Even with their expertise and potential for digital innovation, businesses in the private sector find it difficult to engage in public service development due to a lack of guidance and motivation. In response to these issues, the Korean government has established the vision of digital platform government. Next slide, please. Digital platform government means a government that works with citizens and businesses to solve social problems and create new values upon the digital platform where all data are connected. Through the implementation of digital platform government, we provide proactive, personalized, and seamless public services for citizens. Furthermore, we use the data and artificial intelligence to facilitate uh, scientific and rational government management. Most of all, as a foundation of these changes, we'll establish ecosystem for public-private collaboration. Next slide, please. Um, these are nine principles of digital platform government. Considering the given time, I will not label each principle today. However, you can easily notice that these principles are in accordance with digital guidelines and toolkits developed by UN. Next slide, please. I would like to introduce several examples of digital platform government. Uh, the first one, the virtual assistant for citizens is a new service that use, uses a pub, pub, public private partnership approach for personalized and proactive service delivery. Citizens can use prop, popular commercial apps like internet messengers and bank apps to receive personalized notifications and interact with government. The government provides the service backend while the private sector implements the front end. Next slide, please. The Korean government is using blockchain technology to create a national digital ID platform. These digital IDs are stored on personal devices and carry the same legal weight as traditional ID cards. The platform is safe, reliable, and has a decentralized architecture. The government has already launched digital IDs for public officers and driver's license. Next slide, please. And to support data-based public-private partnership and growth of digital economy, the Korean government will focus on opening public data that are practically usable and economically valuable upon the demand of citizens and businesses. We will also concentrate on regulatory innovation for open data to remove bureaucratic barriers against open data. For the whole of government data standardization, this data standard management system will be de developed and there will be a regular inspection and assessment on data quality of each public organization. The existing public data portal will be reformed into the cloud-based all-in-one platform for citizens to combine, and analyze, and share public and private data at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, to facilitate decision-making based on data with the whole of government approaches, we implement a government-wide data platform through, through which all ministers can share, connect, analyze, and utilize and manage data. In addition, we use artificial intelligence to collect, cleanse, test, categorize, and analyze data more efficiently and quickly. Next slide, please. So now the last example is the data government service API platform. 
This is the core platform for public private service measure. The Korean government will adopt the concept of microservice architecture and develop APIs for key components of government services to open them to both public and private sector. Currently, we are in planning phase of this project and we are well aware that this task could be very difficult as it requires the complete overhaul of the current digital government services. Next slide, please. And I would like to close. Oh, sorry about that. The slide was not just no. Um, I would like to close my presentation with our future expectations uh, on the vision of digital platform government. Citizens will have better lives with the proactive and personal services. Businesses will grow in the ecosystem for innovation based on public private partnership. And the government will become more transparent, reasonable, and reliable through data driven and scientific administration. As we are still in the first stage of the implementation of digital platform government, I hope that I can share more next time. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Mrs. Brown, for introducing Korea's policies, including the current issues to be addressed and very productive on data integration and the importance of data partnership with the private sector. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Sean Doro, Program Officer of ITU Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, to deliver a presentation on challenges, approaches, and strategies with digital government transformation. Mr. Doro, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Moderator, and uh, a very good day to all distinguished guests. Um, first and foremost, on behalf of ITU and Ms. Asuko Goodell, Regional Director of ITU Regional Office, I'd like to congratulate uh, and also extend our sincere appreciation to UNDESA and UNSCAP for their partnership and for organizing this very important uh, webinar on advancing digital government transformation, as well as uh, the launching of the toolkit on capacities for digital government transformation. Um, today, I am pleased to take this opportunity to share some of the development on supporting digital transformation, highlighting why we need to accelerate capacities to uh, support digital government transformation. Next slide, please. So um, allow me to briefly introduce about ITU. Next slide, please. Uh, we are a specialized UN agency, uh, agency for information and communication technologies. For over 150 years, we've been advancing information and communication technologies and promoting universal connectivity. Next slide, please. And here uh, you can see, uh, you'll be able to find our strategic plan, uh, which we pursue two key goals, which is uh, universal connectivity, as well as sustainable digital transformation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our office in the regional office, for, uh, our regional office in Asia Pacific, we are responsible to implement the ITU regional initiative uh, for Asia Pacific. And it is to support our member countries uh, in this region. Um, these regional initiatives, they are developed every four years at the World Telecommunication Development Conference. And this five initiative guides our work in addressing the digital divide. Next slide, next slide please. So um, with that introduction, I'd like to take this opportunity to share some recent figures re uh, relevant to our discussion today. Next, please. So in our latest facts and figures uh, for 2022, as uh, I think mentioned by Mr. Vicencio, uh, Vicenzo Akoro, uh, he mentioned that, that digital devices persist and a significant challenge, uh, it poses a significant challenge in achieving sustainable digital transformation for both the government as well as the society. And uh, as you can see in the figures uh, on the screen, the world has made up, even though the world has made some progress in internet access, um, there are still significant disparities which remains, uh, especially amongst the LDCs. Um, bridging this gap, particularly in the area of internet use, uh, gender, digital generation, affordability, urban versus rural, as well as access, these are essential uh, for ensuring equal opportunities and inclusive, uh, sustainable development. Next slide, please. 
And if we were to look into the figures a little deeper, LDCs, just over one third of the population uh, use the internet compared to the two third of the world um, uh, globally or in high income countries. Um, in LDCs, only one third of women use the internet and less than 30% of the rural population uses the internet. And uh, for low income countries, and uh, particularly 90% of young women and girls between the age of 15 to 24, uh, they do not use the internet. So apart from LDCs falling behind the global average, we see you know, we can see the significant disparities between, um, you know, different categories, urban and rural areas, uh, between male and females um, users. So it is crucial that we, we look into these uh, uh, differences and, and so that we can help address uh, and promote equal access to, and participation in digital transformation. Next slide, please. Um, additionally, even uh, in the context of infrastructure, even though it is available, uh, there is often a gap between those who have access to a mobile broadband network and those who actually use the internet. And this is where addressing barriers like affordability and in the context of today's discussion, uh, developing the capacity of both at both government as well as community level with relevant digital skills uh, becomes very it becomes essential uh, to ensure that uh, sustainable use of the internet, uh, including government services. Next slide, please. So with this figures in mind, uh, I hope to highlight and share some of the challenges and approaches that we could consider. Uh, next slide, please. Digital transformation. Um, brings about various challenges, um, addressing the interdependencies among digital technologies, uh, communication infrastructure, and also skills development. Uh, uh, one of them having an effective leadership and political will, institutional capabilities, um, substantial investment. Uh, these are also key to ensure successful implementation uh, of ICT sector and, and digital transformation strategy, strategies. And, and also finally, uh, the uh, the uh, organization capabilities, process innovation, and, and institutional learning. These are some of the challenges that we see um, that could uh, in the digital transformation. Next slide, please. Hence, um, for ITU, we agree, uh, I think, uh, and, and also advocate the adoption of a whole of government approach. I think when it comes to promoting integration and coordination of effort across um, different government sectors uh, and also stakeholders, aligning uh, international goals such as the SDG uh, with national visions and implementation plan, um, this framework can help ensure coordination, integration and collaboration across sector, as well as drive um, digital transformation. Next slide, please. Um, I wish to share perhaps a few impact cases on digital transformation, which perhaps we could we could uh, look into uh, or learn from. Uh, in the case of Bhutan, the uh, digitalization of or digitalizing the driver uh, driver's licenses and vehicle registration, uh, they have been able to remove the need to carry paper documents and and also. Uh, enable more devices. In the case of India, the direct uh, benefit transfer or DBT um, has reached billions of beneficiaries. And then uh, in the case of uh, resilient network, ensuring uh, access even after uh, a major network went offline due to um, disaster, um, for example, Cyclone Herald that happened in Vanuatu uh, April last year. So these are some of the examples of um, digital transformation in action. Uh, next slide, please. So these initiatives are cross-sectoral in nature and requires resources to scale up across sector and, uh, uh, and, and also geographies. Um, hence, we need an ecosystem approach uh, to avoid fragmented digital governance and also um, creating silos. Um, hence, we advocate we, uh, a partnership which is critical towards success of digital transformation. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, hence, uh, this toolkit uh, today, the capacities for digital government transformation, I we believe is timely uh, at the government level 
there's definitely a need to accelerate the building of necessary capacities and skill for successful implementation of the digital government. Um, this toolkit, alongside other resources such as IT publication or enterprise architecture, uh, both uh, highlight it highlights importance of strategic planning, governance, as well as, as, well as alignment of digital initiative. Uh, it provides a comprehensive approach to the digital transformation. Next slide, please. Um, let me quickly perhaps mention a GovStack initiative uh, launched by ITU in 2021. Uh, it, it is a solution for guidance uh, to overcome challenges in digital transformation, um, which aims to build sustainable digital public infrastructure and create human-centered digital services. Um, next slide, please. And within the GovStack here, you can find some of the focus areas of the GovStack initiative, which I invite you to look into um, later. Next slide, please. Um, here, you can see some examples of this approach in action, uh, which includes Smart Village we are currently uh, piloting in Gokina, Pakistan, as well as um, the Smart Island uh, initiative that it, we are currently um, working uh, implementing in Vanuatu, South Malikula. Uh, these are some of the examples where uh, digital technologies are leveraged uh, to enhance services as well as improve quality of life in remote areas. Next slide, please. And a key to this, uh, key to the success of this initiative, again, uh, apart from government, is also equipping individuals with the, with digital skills. Um, ITU San Francisco's uh, Digital Transformation Center Initiative is one of the example uh, of offering programs that provides necessary knowledge and competency, digital literacy, and basic digital skills level. Next slide, please. And uh, also promoting digital inclusion uh, is fundamental to digital transformation. Initiatives like Girls in ICT Day uh, bridges gender digital gap, uh, gender digital gap also, and also promoting equal access to digital skills, hence uh, creating more inclusive, diverse uh, digital society. Next, please. And uh, finally, as, as mentioned earlier, we want to continue to foster partnership and uh, collaboration to help uh, accelerate drive digital transformation. So in 2021, we launched the Partner to Connect initiative, uh, which fostered collaboration and knowledge sharing amongst partners. Uh, we invite uh, uh, like-minded organizations to mobilize resources, partnerships, uh, and commitment uh, to you know, bring forward universal meaningful connectivity, especially to, hard, to connect communities, LDCs, LLDCs, as well as SIDS. Next slide, please. So on that note, um, I hope you find the information useful. Uh, thank you very much for your kind intention, and uh, we stand available to support um, countries to drive digital government transformation, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, moderator. Thank you, Mr. Doron, for providing IT right now initiatives, including whole of government and ecosystem approaches and strategies to accelerate the digital transformation of government services. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Tang Hyun Kim, Chief of ICT and Development Section, UMSGov, to deliver his presentation on digital government for an inclusive digital transformation. Mr. Kim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. That is, uh, I uploaded my PPT. I hope you can see it. Could you confirm? Can you see the PPT? Yes, we can see you. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good good morning and good evening. That is, uh, my name is Taeyong Kim. I'm, I'm chief of the ICT and development section of SCAP. So I'd like to make a short presentation about the digital government for the inclusive digital transformation. Okay, is that is, uh, I understand all the participants are experts on this, that I shortly introduced about the digitalization and digitalization, digital transformation. Uh, ESCAP is a start that is, uh, we are, uh, are thinking that digitalization and digital transformation is a, different concept and the new phenomenon. For example, digitalization is uh, from analog to uh, digital format for efficiency. And then digitalization is more focusing on the leveraging digital technology for productivity. But 
we couldn't find the definition of the digital transformation in the national level. And th there are some definitions in a business model, a business level, but we cannot. So we uh, uh, make the new define uh, that is what is the meaning of the digital transformation. So you know, according to the Asia Pacific Digital Transformation Report to 2022, saying is that a new development paradigm and the process. So what is the key nature of the digital transformation? Uh, that is, uh, I think that is irreversibility. What I mean is that is a structure already changed. If you want to go back, but cannot go back. For example, if you wanted to go to the branch of the, your banking, uh, banking uh, uh, company, but is your branch already gone? So you cannot go to, you have to go to the online only. That is a big challenge to the old people who are weak to the digitalization. So it's that if this transformation is a new phenomenon, a new social uh, structure change, that is the uh, first, first challenge is that how to understand the digital, uh, changing digital environment. It is more rapid and comprehensive and complex and then interdependent. And then if the digital uh, structure and the environment changes, how to build that new development paradigm and the regulatory framework? It should be a more flexible, adaptive, co collaborative, yes. But uh, truly the implement or building is uh, really challenging. Another one is that is uh, how to set the government role again that you know, in, in advancing digital transformation. So to respond to the demand or this changing environment to that is ESCAP is uh, 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 do some actions uh, in a different level. One is that Intergovernment level is that we organized the uh, uh, first Asia Pacific Digital Minister Conference uh, in the collaboration with the uh, Minister of Science and ICT of Korea. And then we are planning to organize that Asia Pacific High Level Policy Dialogue for Global Digital Compact you know, tentatively in October 2023. And then also my director indicated that is, uh, we are planning to organize the second Asia Pacific Digital Minister Conference in October. Kazakhstan 2024 Kazakhstan. And then we are continuing to operate in the United Nations Special Program for Economic and uh, Economies of Central Asia. Her name is Becca. And the secondly, that we are also is, uh, conducting some analytical research that we are produced the Asia Pacific Digital Transformation Report to 2022. That also we are operating that Asia Pacific ICT network that called. Asia Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative. I guess that this is the only, only one in Asia Pacific region to cover all the Asia Pacific region is that. And then member countries that adopted the ESCAP resolution 79 10 is to promote Asia Pacific Information Superhighway Action Plan 2022-2026. Also, we are implementing a, a few projects and program for institutional capacity building. I showed a little bit details that is uh, this is uh, uh, first Asia Pacific Digital Minister Conference in 2022 that around 25 ministers and the head of the missions attended uh, a conference, and then nine international organizations, the UN entities joined, and the 15 private sectors uh, like the Amazon, Samsung uh, uh, neighbor is attended and share their, their business model uh, with the ministers. In terms of analytical uh, uh, research, that is, uh, as I said, that this is uh, left side is that Asia Pacific Digital Transformation Report. That uh, that is one of the key key feature is we developed to that digital transformation framework and then uh, index that, and then we found out that Asia Pacific is most digitally divided among sub regions. You can see the right side in the candle chart that is most most uh, widely strategic. So we can say that this Asia Pacific is most digitally divided in the world. This is the status of the on all seven uh, countries globally that the white color, gray color is uh, countries that we cannot uh, analyze because of the lack of the data. So we didn't make the 
we didn't release uh, the ranking because we are not sure one hundred percent that our methodology is correct and data is correct. But it's, uh, we'll do uh, repeat again the second edition of the digital transformation report in 2024. We can see the more clear picture. This is a Shepherdship Information for our initiative that we have three working groups that one is uh, infrastructure, one working group two is that uh, digital technology and the working group three is the uh, digital data. So this each working groups met monthly, once a month and then exchange the opinion and then make the plan to implement the action plan. This is the uh, three working groups. That for example, working group one is chair is Armenia in the United States, America and vice chair is Kazakhstan, Sri Lanka, and Uzbekistan. Working group two and three, same. Also, I wanted to introduce our project in, in SCAP on ICT. That is, uh, we are uh, keep highlighting and then uh, promoting regional connectivity and the Asia Fashion Information for IA. And then we are implementing one project focusing on the exper experimental sandbox in collaboration with DESA. In case of the Maldives, we are working on the central bank digital currency. And then also we are working on rural and urban ICT and transport to connectivity, focusing on the core collaboration, the core deployment of the ICT and transport infrastructure. And then also we are highlighting internet exchange point in the Pacific and then ASEAN region, but this uh, ASEAN project is completed. And then we are just started the digital for clean air for Southern ASEAN called HASA project. And then we are promoting continuously SPECA program and APIS in Central Asia every year. And then we submitted uh, one donor to get the funding for special capacity building program for digital transformation in a target in the Pacific region. This is a, a concept of the internet exchange point, for example, that is, uh, 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 for example, that Myanmar, if you are in a Myanmar, one of the internet, this internet go to the Singapore and back to the Laos. So we're trying to connect the directly Myanmar and Laos. I think it's more save the cost and the speed. This is the Pacific IX, internet IXPs that is, uh, we are working with Fiji, Samoa and New Zealand as a Pacific node to promote the regional, sub-regional internet connectivity. This is the infrastructure corridor simulator that is to find out which uh, 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 route is most economically uh, effective and cost efficient. That this is simulator. This is also we are operating the infrastructure portal. This is the ease resilience monitoring dashboard. So it's my last slide that is uh, we are talking about the digital transformation, the digital government, that a digital government role is quite critical in advancing digital transformation. I propose three, uh, three, three dimensions. One is that is the digital transformation should contribute to the national competitiveness in the sense that this government should play more coordinating role and then also advancing role of the SDG also promote the production, the sustainable production supply consumption change. And then also in terms of the system-wide focusing, invest in the digital data system and infrastructure. Second one is more focusing on the productivity of the business and manufacturing sector. So especially promoting sharing of the knowledge product and then also revisit the regulatory framework and they provide more scientific uh, findings to the uh, business sectors. Lastly, this is the most important one is that digital transformation is, should provide the more better value and the better service to people. Uh, without that is what is the meaning of the national competitive or productivity. So I think it's the most important one is that to provide more, make the people happy, more, more valued or something. Lastly, that we are operating Asia Pacific Information Supply Initiative as uh, one sole regional ICT connectivity. Uh, please welcome to join and share your knowledge and then your uh, plan and activities. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Kim, for elaborating global landscape and as top mainstream on digital government transformation. And this concludes the session one. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation by our distinguished speakers. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Kenji Tan, Senior Manager of Technology Management Office, GovTech Singapore, to moderate the session two. Mr. Tan, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, esteemed colleagues, uh, and warm greetings from Singapore. So I am Kengi, I'm from GovTech Singapore. I would like to thank the, the organizers for inviting me to moderate this session on the introduction of the toolkit. First, I'd like to say that um, this toolkit is very useful and timely in supporting your respective digital government transformation journeys. And from Singapore's perspective, I think it is important to engineer capabilities within the government in our digital transformation journey. In Singapore, we integrate our public services through various initiatives, such as the Digital Government Blueprint and the Ministry Family Digitalization Plan. And our government fully supports key strategic national projects like our national, um, national digital identity, Life SG, and e-payments, et cetera. And uh, without much ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Jing and Mr. Yao to deliver a joint presentation to give an overview introduction of the toolkit. Mr. Jeng and Mr. Yao, the floor is yours. Professor Chen, you go ahead. Professor Chen, you are here. Professor Cheng Lei, you are with us or not? Do I need to pick up? Can you please unmute? We cannot hear you. Okay. Yes. Mm. Okay. Can you hear me now? Mm. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. I. Uh, uh, I couldn't turn on my voice and uh, the chairs need to turn on. So I'm waiting for the uh, to invite me to turn. On. Okay, it's more. Uh, so I, I'm not going to share my slides. Okay, so you can see my slides now. Okay, so first, I will, uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to be invited by your Indesa to prepare this training toolkit that is for digital government transformation and under the guidance of officials and experts. Uh, from UNDESA, uh, like uh, Mr. Uh, Keping Yao, Wai Ming, and Joanna. And I will give an overall introduction of the training toolkit uh, together with Mr. Yao Keping from UNDESA. Uh, so next slide, please. And my name is Lei Le Zhen. I'm from Fudan University. I'm a professor at the School of International, uh, International Relations and Public Affairs, and I'm also the director of the Lab for Digital Mobile governance. So first, I would like to uh, share why do we need a training toolkit on capacities for digital government uh, transformation. And digital government plays an increasing, uh, increasingly vital role in accelerating the realization of the 23rd agenda for sustainable development and ensuring that no one is left behind, uh, left behind. While realizing the importance of benefits of digital government transformation, Many countries, especially those countries in special situations, are confronted with a multitude of challenges, notably in technological governance and institutional dimensions. And so UNDESA supports the member states in strengthening their capacities for digital government transformation for achieving sustainable developments. Development. 
So we also list a number of pros and cons of using digital technologies in government in this training toolkit. Uh, so first on the pros, digital uh, technology applications can provide users with quick and easy access to public service and programs. And they can also facilitate building part, uh, participatory governance mechanisms that allows people to become involved in decision making and the design, creation, and production of services. Digital technologies can also foster great government openness and accountability, and it can be leveraged to increase public trust. However, information has also created many challenges for government. In particular, the use of digital technologies in the public sector poses risks and threats to security and widens digital divide within and across countries, and potentially undermines human rights, digital privacy, and security. And this graph demonstrates the relationship between capacity, output, and impact. The capacity is the basis of digital government transformation. When the capacity of digital government trans uh, transformation is improved, the outputs of digital government transformation, such as service applications, will be increased as well. Furthermore, in improved capacity and outputs will bring better imp impacts. In this toolkit, we will, we will focus on capacity buildings for digital government transformation. So uh, through this pyramid, we can see that capacity is at a basis and then capacity produce outputs and output produce impacts. So in capacity is very important. It's the foundation of uh, government uh, digital government transformation. And this toolkit actually focus on capacity building. And this is a table of content of training toolkits. And I will demonstrate the overall structure of the toolkit with the uh, next slide. So let's go to the next slide and the overall structure of the toolkits. And also next, please. Yeah, this is a table of contents. And I'm going to uh, introduce it, the relationship of those chapters uh, uh, from this uh, chapter, uh, this slide. So first, the two chapter, the first two chapters, the general introduction and a holistic approach gives a overall introduction on the importance of promoting and accelerating digital government transformation through a holistic approach. Chapter three to six elaborates on the four steps and the blocking, uh, the building blocks of the implementing digital government transformation include first, situation analysis, second, future envisioning, third, strategy roadmap and capacity development, fourth, monitoring, evaluation and improvement. Finally, chapter seven wraps up the whole programs with the action plan exercise and the training evaluation. And next slide, please. The process of digital government, uh, government, uh, government transformation includes four steps. So first, situation analysis. We need to undertake a situation analysis to access, to assess digital government transformation capacity gaps and opportunities. Second, future envisioning. We need to articulate a shared vision of government transformation and how digital government, digital technology will be leveraged to achieve societal goals. Third, strategy and roadmap. We then need to devise a strategy and a digital government implementation roadmap in which key pillars are identified. Fourth, monitoring and evaluation. It's the last but not least, we need to put monitoring and evaluation mechanisms in place to collect feedback that should then be used to inform the subsequent rounds of situation analysis, strategy development, and implementation. Next slide, please. Then in this toolkit, we also introduce some tools that could be used in situation analysis, such as DGCA, which includes six dimensions, such as leadership, strategy, governance, legal, technology, and professional and workforce development. We also listed nine key pillars of a roadmap for digital government transformation. And the first one is vision, leadership, and mindsets. Second one is institutional, institutional and a regular, a regulatory framework. Third is organizational setup and a culture. Fourth, system, system thinking and integration. Fifth one, data governance. Uh, sixth one, ICT infrastructure and affordability and access to technology. 
number seven, resources. Number eight, capacities of capacity developers. And number nine, societal capacities. So that's the key nine pillars of a roadmap for digital government transformation. And we also emphasize that we need to develop capacities at four levels. So the first level is the institutional, is the inst institutional level. At the, the institutional level, the importance of establishing an institutional, uh, in, uh, institutional ecosystem for government transformation is very important. And the critical role of regulators, the type of the institutional capacities are needed for digital governments and the key elements of how to establish a comprehensive institutional framework should be also in place. Second, capacity at organizational level. The import is about the importance of government interoperability to support the sharing of information and services. The importance of changing the organizational culture to foster collaboration and innovation within the public sector is also emphasized as well in this uh, toolkit. Capacity at the, the individual level is the third uh, level we need to be uh, we need to focus on because it is necessary to develop capacities at the individual level for effective digital government transformation. What types of capacities are needed and why it's critical for governments to recruit and retain the best talent for digital government transformation. It also highlights the need for multidisciplinary teams in governments and for safe spaces in which individuals can nurture innovation. And then the last level is the capacity at a societal level, which analyze the critical role of developing capacities at a societal level and how governments can promote digital inclusion. So uh, next, uh, 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 my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Yao Keping, Mr. Yao Keping from UNDESA are going to present uh, the next slides. Thank you, Professor Cheng, yeah. So now I will talk a little bit about the, the key points, how to better develop capacities, yeah. Firstly, I mean, the institutes and the schools of government and the public administration, they are very uniquely positioned to play a key role in strengthening the skills and the digital capacities necessary for the implementation of the 23rd agenda. So our next session, actually, uh, we invited uh, the representatives from the schools of uh, public administration. Uh, they will give us some uh, 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 advice and the recommendation, the commitments, how the mainstream they uh, took it uh, in their in the curricula of uh, peer schools, you know. And also UNDESA's Division for Public Institution and Digital Government and also the UNPOG. We can also provide a targeted capacity development and training upon the request of the country. And also, it's also very important digital to uh, develop in digital capacities with the uh, stakeholders for creation and a cooperation to promote uh, digital inclusion. And also, it's very important that, uh, you know, uh, it's important to empower uh, the vulnerable populations and enhance the capacities of those people uh, through the bridging of the divide. Next, please. And so uh, what does this toolkit provide? Uh, actually, uh, uh, the head of UNPOC, Mr. Ko, already briefly mentioned in his opening remarks. So this to, uh, training toolkit provides our national or uh, local governments with a set of comprehensive frameworks, practical strategy and tools. It provides a step-by-step -step guideline on how to conduct a situation analysis and undertaking a uh, envision exercise and devise a strategy and roadmap. It also helps examine how to develop capacities at all levels, and it provides concrete uh, methodologies, and also it provides country case studies from across the world, and also inc it includes a set of quiz, exercise, and lessons learned and reflections. Next, please. And also the purpose of this children training toolkit, uh, basically it provides a better understanding why we need a holistic approach for digital government transformation and what capacities are required for digital government transformation and how to uh, develop capacity for digital government transformation. Next, please. Yeah, this one uh, I also already briefly mentioned before. Uh, the, the, the research uh, uh, methodology is based on the two editions of UN Governance Survey, plus a desk research of the report by international organizations and also the, the, uh, the research of the case studies. Next, please. 
So how can this uh, training uh, toolkit be used? It can enhance the conceptual understanding and also help member countries' digital government transformation experience and the developing government capacities toward the digital transformation from situation analysis uh, to assess the gaps and to the envision exercise to and uh, develop the national strategy and roadmap. Uh, it's also uh, with uh, uh, equipped with a uh, uh, set of exercise uh, in an interactive way for users to reflect and, and the practices. Again, as I, I briefly mentioned, that uh, this toolkit uh, could be available at uh, the OnPOC and OnPen website. You can uh, either use the PDF version or or, or, or PPT version uh, for your self-paced learning. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it concludes my uh, our pre uh, joint presentation. Uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Tan. Are you? Uh, can you unmute? <laughs> Good. Good. All right, thank you colleagues for the introduction. I uh, hope this can help our participants implement this toolkit in accordance, in accordance to their respective national contexts. And this will conclude session two. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Anna Chowdhury, Policy Advisor, A2I Bangladesh, to moderate session three. Mr. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, dear participants, I'm um, the policy advisor of the Aspire to Innovate program of the of the uh, Bangladesh government from the Cabinet Office, Prime Minister's Office, and ICT Ministry, supported by UNDP. Uh, the Aspire to Innovate program, or short in short, A2I, uh, has been running for the last uh, 15 years, uh, providing inclusive digital transformation and uses empathy to foster innovation. Uh, within civil service in Bangladesh. It champions the global collaborative platform and public service innovations. And also it has developed a multinational uh, digital transformation uh, platform uh, for a number of countries. It's a transformation catalyst from the government, uh, working also with the private sector and the academia quite a bit. Uh, I'm very glad to be moderating this session today. I, I just happened to be in uh, Korea and thanks to uh, Mr. Kipping, Yao and his colleagues uh, attending in November of last year, uh, a lot of discussion uh, on this toolkit. And I think it's a, it's a great toolkit for many countries and nations to actually uh, develop their uh, capacity for digital transformation within government and also within the, uh, the various uh, public administration uh, training academies. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. John Nakabego, uh, President, African Association of Public Administration and Management, AAPAM, to deliver his presentation on developing digital capacities of capacity developers to promote digital government transformation in Africa. Uh, uh, John, the floor is yours. And I'd like Thank to remind you. all panelists to keep their uh, uh, intervention to within five minutes or so because we're actually running quite late. Thank you very much. Please go ahead, John. Uh, thank you very much, distinguished participants. On behalf of the African Association of Public Administration and Management, APAM, I'd like to express our gratitude for inviting us to participate at this very, very important event. Let us go straight to slide three. three. Slide number three. Number three. Next. Uh, by way of introduction, APAM has been at the forefront. Back a bit. Please go back. Uh, yes, APAM has been at the forefront for promoting excellence in the public administration across. Africa. And this presentation will emphasize the importance of building capacities of capacity developers, senior government officials, individuals, and societies in digital government. In terms of APAM, we serve as the catalyst for facilitating collaboration among governments, academia, and industry partners. So we are here to share lessons learned uh, in this area. Next, 
Next, please. Next slide. Next slide. So this presentation will emphasize the importance of digital building digital capacities of both government officials and capacity developers. I will be suggesting avenues for mainstreaming, mainstreaming the tool sheet in the curricula of public administration schools. Incidentally, I'm a director of Uganda Management Institute, which is a public administration school. Shall we show? I'll also be highlighting the importance of enhancing capacities at individual and society levels. Next, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, what is the importance of enhancing digital capacities of government officials and capacity de developers? First, increased innovation in public administration. When you equip senior government officials with digital skills, they are better prepared to embrace emerging technologies and leverage data-driven insights and to adapt to change. Here we are emphasizing mainly mindset change and also digital skills. The other important issue is that it improves quality of service delivery. When we equip senior government officials and capacity developers with the digital capacities, they are able to provide high quality services to citizens. This enables overall citizen experience, increased satisfaction and it builds trust in the government institutions. Next slide. Next. I want to highlight some suggestions for mainstream, mainstreaming the toolkit in the curricula of public administrations. First, we have to build the capacities of lecturers. Lecturers have to be equipped with the necessary knowledge, skills to deliver the courses effectively. And this can be done through capacity development programs. Number two suggestion, promote collaboration with stakeholders such as other schools or public administration in African regions, government agencies and civil society. This is necessary for ensuring that the toolkit is integrated in our curricula. In addition, we have to provide access to digital and platforms, which is necessary. This, we should provide this to students. The students should be exposed to digital platforms so that they can gain experience on how to apply the knowledge in real life situations. Next, next slide, please. Next slide. I'll be highlighting the importance of enhancing capacities at individual and society levels. There are, this lays a, enhancing individual capacities for digital government transformation lays a good foundation for innovation and entrepreneurship. Individuals with digital skills can leverage digital technologies to create businesses, employment opportunities, which can spur economic growth. Digital government transformation at society level enables citizens to access public service and information conveniently from anywhere at any time. Online pro platforms can promote access to services without the need for physical presence or contact. Next, next slide, please. Enhancing capacities at society levels ensures that more people 
particularly women, youth, and people living with disabilities have the skills to use digital devices to engage with their governments, exchange views, and contribute to policy development, thus fostering civic engagement, particularly in Africa. It also enhances transparency and accountability. Next slide, please. Next slide. I want to share in conclusion some recommendations. Recommendation number one, governments in Africa should develop a digital strategy which highlights their vision, goals, objectives for digital government transformation. Recommendation number two, foster collaboration and partnerships. That is collaboration between agencies, private sector organizations, civil society and academia for successful digital government transformation. Number three, enhance digital infrastructure. Governments should prioritize resources for building digital infrastructure. Lastly, strengthen digital skills and capacities. Countries should prioritize development of digital skills among public servants, providers, and in areas such as cyber security, emerging technologies, and digital service delivery. Next. Next slide, please. Governments should ensure or foster digital inclusion. African countries should strive to bridge the digital divide and ensure that all citizens have equal access to digital services. This requires addressing issues of affordability, literacy, accessibility, particularly for marginalized and underserved populations. Next slide. Next slide. Next. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the toolkit on capacities for digital government transformation is a valuable resource for governments in the African region, which aspire to improve their digital capabilities. The toolkit is particularly very useful in the African context, where many governments are still in the early stages of developing their digital capacities. By providing practical guidance on how to approach digital transformation, mm -hmm. the toolkit can help governments overcome the challenges they face in this area, such as lack of infrastructure and limited resources. I thank you very much for enabling us to participate in this event. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nakabego, thank you very much for focusing on some very important aspects of public administration capacity development in Africa, such as mindset change, skills development, and partnership with private sector and uh, civil society and academia as well. Uh, it reminds me in Bangladesh, we ran uh, a training program called Empathy Training for uh, several years, uh, training about 35,000 civil servants. And uh, we actually provided training, but also uh, uh, help develop projects on focusing on mindset change skills and partnership with private sector and civil society. So it just reminds me uh, the the focus area that you had. Uh, we actually trained in Bangladesh, and uh, it, it really resonates uh, with the work that you're doing in Africa. Thank you very much for that, and also thank you for the very comprehensive and practical recommendations you made at the end. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Shah Nasir Khan, head of UN Resident Coordinator Office in Pakistan to deliver his presentation on digital government transformation in Pakistan. Dr. Khan, the floor is yours, and may I uh, request kindly to leave it within five minutes or so. Thank you. Bismillahir um, Rahman Rahim. Good afternoon and um, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Anir. And first of all, let me extend my uh, congratulations and uh, facilitations to all the um, UNPOG colleagues, DESA, who have been 
instrumental in putting this toolkit together, which is extremely, extremely useful and um, it seems to be something that was missing and uh, we have um, had it to, to get a, a good opportunity of working towards a digital transformation. So I'll uh, just uh, a case of Pakistan. Next slide, please. I'll, please, I'll, I'll quickly uh, give you a snapshot. Uh, next. Yeah. So as you can see, a, a country of 238 million. And uh, if you look at the demographic uh, profile of it, uh, 200 million population with an average age of just 22.8. So it's it's the fifth youngest country in the world. Um, it can um, tell you something about how uh, how important it is for the digital transformation, a case that's extremely important. The population of the existing one uh, even makes uh, uh, more than number of countries, the total population together. So, uh, and then you can look at the literacy part of it, especially the female literacy of 46.5% and um, how important it is that we go digital and, um, and get the opportunities for that. Next, please. The, as you can see some figures again from uh, the cellular mobile connections that we have uh, 191.8 million, uh, which is around 80% of uh, the population and uh, the internet users um, 87 million. And let me tell you that it's around, it's uh, in uh, between 2021 and 2022, there has been increase of 22 million, which is 35.9% uh, uh, of increase. Um, so while, and you can see the social media users. So this can just to, to, to uh, touch a, a couple of points. So while this technology and internet footprints has increased significantly, our in internet penetration is uh, still below um, 40%. Uh, the divide is even bigger when it comes to, uh, when we look at it from the gender lens. And um, as uh, uh, my colleagues already in, in the start, they, they are colleagues uh, talked about the leaving no one behind when we talk about gender transformation, that's, that's all. It's, it, this is something which is uh, a greater opportunity that we can work on, that we need to work on. And then there are issues of like, for example, in specifically in Pakistan nowadays, we have a lot of disinformation, misinformation, elections coming and risk of electoral violence due to that propaganda and hate speech. And um, those risks with all these things associated um, plus the climate resilience, which um, having a mobile penetration and internet usage makes it very, very easy for, uh, for the population to be aware of it. So the present landscape make it very much essential for a digital transformation and how we go about it. Next, please. The potential, as you can see from different reports, uh, is around 60 billion to the economy with digital transformation. So um, there is a huge need to prioritize if leveraged fully digital transformation can create a huge impact. Next. Uh, this was something which was done um, by the government and uh, the micropayment gateway, uh, which is free, secure, that was um, started um, year back or so, uh, two years back, sorry. And the state bank launched it with the first instant payment system. Um, it's uh, um, the financial, the 30 million people have already created their IDs, financially, those are financially included part. Uh, and as you can see, like around 2.3 trillion worth of transaction already conducted. So there is the, uh, there, there are, uh, again, as I say, there, is, there are um, ways and means to do it um, and um, how to promote the adoption of digital financial services and increase the financial inclusion. Next, please. Then there is the, then there are these uh, initiatives as the Digital Punjab by the Information Technology Board. Uh, but as I always call it, there is like the, the policy continuity is something that we in Pakistan and maybe um, it can be same for many other countries uh, in the region and uh, around the globe, uh, at the, the uh, developing countries where, where the policy continuity and the political uh, governments makes a lot of issues of continuity of these services. 
So where, while one government starts it, the next government, it, it slows uh, it down. Um, so there are a few notable initiatives uh, like this, but uh, things are, um, again, as I say, um, a lot of need, what, what actually we need to do. Next, please. And I'll try to be quick now with the time. So the, the challenges, as you as you see, what would not uh, the challenge is not one of policy formulation and planning, but implementation. And uh, we have seen it's the molding the mindset for a digital Pakistan. Um, of course, uh, insufficient digital infrastructure. We are uh, one fiftieth out of one ninety three in the in government government survey, um, and. Um, the digital literacy gap is uh, huge. Uh, I think forty uh, percent of household Pakistan have a computer literate person. Bureaucratic hurdles, as you can see, was uh, is something which uh, which is at the center of it. And the resistance stems from the fear of transparency, loss of power, perceived threat of job redundancy. Um, and there is a lot of trust deficit, in, especially in a structure where we have federal provincial structures to sharing sensitive information with uh, everyone, with the private sector, especially and amongst the government. This is something which, which are coming up as a major challenges for digital government transformation. Next, please. Yeah, and the, the last one, how we can leverage it. And um, and um, I must congratulate you and SIU and POG in, um, in um, helping and supporting us. Uh, so we in RC Office Pakistan with our UN country team, uh, we partnered with UNDESA and uh, DPIDG and BOG, where we forged a very strategic partnership with public administration schools. So it's a toolkit, the governance toolkit, which is mostly focused on changing mindset for uh, achieving SDGs. Digital mindset is something that we get more uh, focused on in some ways and get a lot of interest and attention and feedback. Um, we are trying to, we have started it like last uh, uh, more than a one year, uh, around six courses have been conducted at national management course, the senior most, uh, then middle career management and um, uh, the senior management courses. And our understanding is that civil servants are well positioned to create transformative change with, with a change in mindset. If they have a digital government, um, um, the, the digital mindset, the government transformation uh, becomes much, much easier. So that's what we are working on. And the challenges, of course, as uh, um, um, uh, colleagues highlighted, some of the colleagues, is the capacities that are available to do these type of uh, capacity strengthening initiatives in public administration schools. Uh, but overall, um, huge thanks to uh, UN POG and DESA um, and uh, that they, that and the UN system, um, the colleagues from uh, here, we are uh, trying to do and work on that. But a pool of trainers needs to be created, and we need to see how we can do that at a regional level, at a global level, bringing some experts together, a pool of uh, volunteers who can support on this, like with all the Zoom and the mm, hybrid models that are working in. So I think that will also help us a lot. Um, innovative cases from around the world, uh, um, the, this, uh, the, 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 the new uh, toolkit that's coming up um, at a very crucial time, uh, providing the structural guidance to address the challenges uh, and accelerate country digital government transformation. And of course, like as I said, the innovation cases from around the world, this is a, a huge resource which can inspire and guide the capacity development efforts in Pakistan. And um, we believe uh, the public administration schools uh, a very um, um, effective pool of trainers, like the one, the one, the, the group that we can see here today, um, and which uh, Bog and Desa can um, bring us together, IETU, others. So, uh, how we can influence this to, to be part of the training curricula in the public administration schools and taking it forward. So, with the, 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 these points, I thank you again, Anir and um, Kepeng and colleagues. Um, uh, thanks to you all, and um, looking forward to working with you with this toolkit. Congratulations again. Thank you, Dr. Khan, <clears throat> for outlining the challenges, uh, but also the opportunities. We talked about policy continuity, digital mindset change. I also appreciate the suggestions that you made on promoting the toolkit uh, in the public sector in Pakistan. Especially you talked about the methodologies uh, that will be in the toolkit and also the innovative cases from around, around the world that you will be able to leverage. 
Uh, in fact, the, uh, the innovative case that you talked about in uh, social protection in, in Pakistan, the 30 million beneficiaries, could really be a case that we can uh, use in other countries. So thank you for that. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Hausi Pan, a director of the Secretariat of AAPA, to deliver a presentation on developing digital capacities of capacity developers to promote digital government transformation in the Asia Pacific region. Dr. Pan, the floor is yours. Again, may I request uh, five minutes, please? Thank you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, please. Go okay, ahead. so I will uh, start my presentation. Uh, so I'm very honored to be here today. It's actually today the presentation was uh, planned to be made by uh, Professor Jinan Wu, who is the president of the Asian Association for Public Administration, but unfortunately, Italy, he's on travel right now. So uh, as the director of Secretariat, I will be presenting uh, on behalf of Jianan Wu. I'm Hao Jipan from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And the uh, next slides. Uh, so first I want to give a brief introduction on the AAPA, that's Asian Association for Public Administration. The aim of the, uh, uh, Association is to expand and improve research and academic exchange on public administration and public policy in the Asian uh, region. Uh, in 2001, the AAPA is founded and it was called Asian Public Management Forum at that time. And the 2010 uh, is changed to AAPA, the name now. And in 2016, it's granted the UN consult, uh, consultative status and signed the MOU with UN DESA. And we are holding an annual conference each year. And this year, at the end of the year, we'll have the conference in uh, Meiji University, Japan, Tokyo. Uh, so we AAP has a number of networking and uh, collaborations which signed MOU. Uh, and the first you can see that's uh, the UN DESA and the, the DPIDG. Next slides. Uh, so from uh, last year, AAPA has actually a host or co-host or participate in a series events uh, with the UN DESA. Uh, on the mainstreaming of the UN DESA curriculum, SDG curric cur curriculum and the uh, two kids. Uh, including the November meeting on the training of trainers, December meeting on the uh, 2022 annual meeting of the uh, global initiatives with uh, School of Public Administration on mainstreaming SDGs, and in January, the, 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 the capacity development webinar uh, participated by Pre President Jenna Wu. Next slides. <laughs> so, uh, in this session, we focus on the tool for uh, digital governance and uh, <clears throat> digital governance and SDG. Uh, so, we want to talk about the Shanghai model for good governance. That's where now the, the president, president and I are in, in Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So, the Shanghai model for the good governance is people-centered dig digital governance. And uh, from the experience of the Asia and the world, the digital governments was, uh, has been emphasized three keywords, that's empowerment, collaboration, and the people oriented. In this background, the toolkit is on capacities for digital government transformation uh, speaks right to the needs of PA schools and uh, civil servants. Uh, next slide. And I want to uh, comment a little bit on some key points of the timeliness of the toolkit in the post-COVID uh, uh, world. Uh, first, it's uh, forced or say accelerated digital transformation was occurred during the post-COVID era, both within the government and in the whole economic body. So is the government really prepared for the digital transformation? In the literature, we see a number of matrix evaluating that, including empowerment, collaboration, people-oriented, accountable, uh, equitable, reliable, efficient, and transparent. But we are still facing a number of challenges, which include digital divide, equity, AI, ethics, data privacy, and the trust. Uh, next slide. So I also want to highlight the importance of the toolkit in the post-COVID world. 
And the first, I think the, the, the importance is the authority of motivation because a toolkit by UN DESA, you know, can automatically attract public servants and the government officials. So this can be the go-to and off-the-shelf toolkit and the curriculum for these public servants. And uh, from some of the survey we, uh, we did last year on the curriculum, we see some of the demands from these schools. And uh, you can see some of the keywords are uh, coincided, uh, are correspond to our toolkit, including the post-COVID-19 economic development, development of digitalization, PPP, localizing SDG, and the changing mindset of civil servants. Also, this is, this is a holistic approach, which is very important, that the focus on both digital transformation and SDG, I think the cross-link of these two are very important. Uh, finally, next slide. Uh, so finally, is some recommendations and the future plan plans. Uh, first, we think it's very important to localize the toolkit as well as the cur cur curricula to best fit the educational and the training system in the Asian Pacific region. And second, is to work with, together with different stakeholders, including governments, non-governmental organizations, academic in institutions, and the training schools. And finally, AAPA will work hard on to promote this toolkit among AAPA members uh, to mainstream the toolkit and their curriculum. I think the most important is in the, within the net network, we will continue to host a part besides the annual conference. It's a series of events with partners and uh, various pl uh, platforms including the SDG oriented and the digital governance oriented, uh, these events, seminars, and the promotion of the toolkit. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you so much. Dr. Pan, thank you for being very, very precise and uh, uh, coming up with uh, some recommendations uh, also. I think the localization of the toolkit, that's a very important aspect. Uh, so thank you for your support and uh, uh, the the uh, the effort that you will take for mainstreaming this uh, this toolkit in the curricula of the educational institutions and the public administration schools in the Asia Pacific region. I mean, you sit at a very uh, influential uh, body uh, to to support mainstreaming of that. So thank you for that support. Now let thank me move so to thank you thank you. Let me move to uh, Dr. Alex uh, Brillans. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Alex, really good to see you again. Okay. Uh, the, Secretary General, the Secretary General of Eastern Regional Organization for Public Administration to deliver his presentation on mainstreaming the toolkit in the curricula uh, of the, uh, the public administration school in the Asia Pacific region as well. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank Again, you. If I may request five minutes. Thank it's you. It's so good to see you and my gratitude, of course, to uh, Dr. Kepin Yao and, of course, uh, Unpog for this very important uh, conference or uh, webinar. So uh, I have five minutes and I'll stick to the five minutes. So the next slide, please, uh, will show that uh, Europa is really uh, one of the pioneering organizations in the region. It, it extends from as far as Iran all the way down to Samoa, uh, uh, the Asia Pacific region. And to a certain extent, we started in 1960 and since then we have grown. But I must, import, I must mention that AAP has a lot of partnerships including, of course, UNPAN, we are now uh, with the United Nations Public Administration Network, UNDESA, UNPOG, and of course, the Committee of Experts of Public Art, and a lot of partnerships, including, of course, our, uh, my, our previous speaker, the AAPA, Asian Association of Public Administration, we have worked with them. Point is that public administration schools, public administration institutions, uh, practitioners, and, and academics working together, and Europa is one of, the, one of the networks where all of us work together. And thinking from what the uh, uh, Dr. Kepin mentioned, it's indeed very, very important for us to uh, institutionalize or mainstream that uh, the toolkits through these public administration institutions. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, as I said, from Iran all the way down to Samoa, and I must say very recently, we've also partnered with our colleagues from Kazakhstan, particularly the, the uh, uh, Astana Civil Service. So we continue to expand our partnerships. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the toolkits are very, very important as pointed out by uh, Professor Kepping earlier, no? 
They provide uh, a module specific for digital governance. And, and of course, the earlier presentation pointed out the digital divide. And that's really something that we should um, address. So leaving no one behind. And if we're talking leaving no one behind, the next digital divide, the next divide is really the digital divide. Question, how are we bridging this? Uh, there's any, but even as we're working on the uh, contextual, uh, working on these um, toolkits, as, as uh, presented by the, our previous speaker, it's very, very important to contextualize. No one size fits all. Sure, we have the toolkits, but we localize, we localize, we localize. And I think it's very good. And Undesa has really did a great job, in, in, and Unpok has done a great job in really providing us the general uh, tool, but it has to be localized and contextualized. And, uh, it's, uh, and this there to supplement the different training programs, capacity building programs that we're all doing. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have to maximize the role of HEIs, higher education institutions that do researches, trainings, research and development for, as far as this area is concerned, including, including the, the digital uh, capacitation of our schools, okay? So we provide capacity buildings, trainings, and upscaling the digital capacities, including, including those of government officials, including those of our government bureaucrats. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so I guess what we would like to mention here is it's very, very important. There are already, the toolkit is there. It has to be contextualized. The network is there. I think we're very, very, it's very ripe right now that, hey, it's, it's really ripe that we all go forward as far as contextualizing, as far as developing capacities of our different institutions in incorporating the, this. The toolkits are very important. These are just some of our recommendations based on our work with you and DESA, based on our work with AAPA, and uh, these are some of those. One, build upon hard-earned gains. We continue capacity building interventions through the conduct of training of trainers, okay? Just a, a toolkit on capacities for digital government transformation in collaboration with our global institutions, including, of course, UNPOG, including UNDESA, including AP. Uh, I've met our colleagues from APAM. Um, you know, we work together, I think. So it's very important that we conduct, conduct follow up trainings, whether in person or online. Number two, this was mentioned by earlier, I think, was uh, our colleague from Pakistan. Let's create cohorts of trainers. It's very, very important. The course of trainers composed of officials from universities and public institutions in the Asia Pacific region for easier dissemination. Some people call it training of trainers, but it's very, very important. You have a, a core of trainers who, will really, who are really advocates in this or experts in this. Next slide, please. Uh, we continue sharing good and best practices on how the toolkits, including this toolkit, could be incorporated in, in public administration curriculum among communities. Sharing good practices. This webinar certainly uh, continues on that, but uh, we, all of us have a number of conferences uh, in, in, in a few months. I'll mention them in a while, but we, we should have panels that really enable us to share these uh, toolkits and use them. And I, I put this in ital italicized, taking off from UNDESA toolkits, continue to efforts to localize, localize and contextualize the teaching of research of SDGs among Europa partners in the region. I would like to end by, uh, next slide please. Uh, by inviting you all because in, in our upcoming Europa conference in Vietnam this October, we will have a session particularly on mainstreaming the teaching of SDGs in the curriculum, including mainstreaming these this toolkits. This will be in Europa in October. You can scan, you can scan the, the, or you can write, visit our website. Next slide. And that's in October. And we have another very important conference, the IASIA, this uh, international association International Associations of Schools and Institutes of Administration. It will be held here in Manila this uh, coming July. Please join us. Again, we'll talk about mentioning the SDGs. And finally, uh, we have, um, you might scan the next slide. Now, I'll, I'll, next slide. In our Europa Bulletin, you can scan this. We have news about this, including how we are using these toolkits. So please join us. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Kepping. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amir, for this opportunity in behalf of Europa. Thank you, thank you very much. Alex, thank you very much as always. Uh, let me quote you with a little bit of paraphrasing that no one size fits all, but the toolkit does provide a fantastic foundation to create trainers for digital transformation and opportunities for localization and contextualization. So I think for the, the large number of uh, uh, trainers, training organizations, this is a fantastic uh, toolkit. And thank you for your recommendations and also the commitment that you made to mainstream the toolkit through Europa and its uh, extensive uh, partnerships.
Thank you again. May I now invite our last but not least uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Abir Ashur, Task Manager at the African Local Government Academy of uh, UCLG Africa to deliver a presentation on UCLG, Afri UCLG Africa's strategy to go digital and smart. Ms. Abir, floor is yours. Again, may I request five minutes, please? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. It is my great pleasure and honor to deliver this presentation uh, today on behalf of Dr. Najat Zarro, uh, Director of the Development Branch and uh, ALGA Academy in UCLG Africa. And she's also the president of the International Association of Schools uh, and Institutes uh, of Administration. Uh, next, please. Next. Next slide. So uh, UCLG Africa was created in uh, 2005 as the regional section in Africa. Uh, our headquarters uh, in the uh, Kingdom of Morocco, especially in Rabat. And uh, UCLG Africa represented uh, a gathering of uh, some uh, 54 national and regional associations of local and regional governments. Uh, so uh, we are proud to have our regional flagship event called AfriCities, uh, which uh, brings together stakeholders from across Africa. Next, please. So at UCLG Africa, our vision and mandate revolve around building unity in Africa from its grassroots. We are committed to leaving no one and no place behind in local Africa. Our mission uh, includes connecting people and institutions and working in win-win partnership and co-creation. We strive to anchor quality and standards of excellence while promoting decentralization, local governance, and development. Empowering human capital through diverse methodology, advocacy, capacity building, technical assistance, and knowledge sharing is at the core of our work. We aim to promote performance and professionalism in local Africa. Next, please. So uh, in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, our organization has adapted and stayed connected. We have organized in-house and online coaching sessions uh, to empower our members, networks, and staff. Next, please. The pandemic has highlighted uh, the diverse advantages and opportunities of digital transformation, e-governance and e-service delivery. However, we must acknowledge the digital gap and divide at the local and regional levels in Africa. Our organization recognizes the challenges faced by vulnerable populations, including uh, limited internet access, lack of devices and insufficient uh, digital skills and experience. Therefore, enhancing the digital capacities of these populations is crucial to ensure uh, equitable access and use of digital technologies. By doing so, we empower them to benefit from the opportunities offered by digital transformation, promoting inclusive development in the digital area. Next, please. Uh, to address uh, the challenges of uh, digital government transformation in Africa, especially at the subnational level. Uh, our organization will rely on the training toolkit on capacities for digital government transformation launched today by UNDESA. It is really a comprehensive framework and practical tool offering guidance on assessing capacity gaps, envisaging uh, digital transformation aligned with the SDGs and developing a strategy and roadmap for implementation. African local and regional governments can use this toolkit to enhance service delivery, improve governance processes, and promote digital inclusion. By doing so, we accelerate the progress towards the SDGs. The timely release of this toolkit aligns with the increasing importance of digital technologies and the urgent need for capacity development to leverage their the full potential for sustainable development in Africa. Next, please. Educational and research institutes play a vital role in building the capacity of government officials at both national and subnational levels, as well as society in general. Uh, these institutes can develop and deliver tailored training programs uh, based on the toolkit, equipping uh, government officials with the necessary skills to uh, drive digital government transformation. Uh, furthermore, uh, these institutes can provide expertise research support and resources to strengthen institutional capacities and foster a culture of innovation and digital inclusion. 
collaboration between uh, educational and research institutes, UCLG Africa and UNDESA is crucial in developing and implementing capacity building initiatives that are responsive to the specific needs and context of African local and regional governments. Next, please. So to adapt to the new challenging context and rebuild in a sustainable and resilient way, UCLG Africa has embarked on a transformative journey. We have decided to embrace the multiple opportunities and advantages offered by digital transformation. Our goal is to become a smart Pan-African organization. By leveraging digital technologies, we aim to enhance our operations, strengthen our connections, and increase our impact. Going digital and becoming a smart organization will enable us to better serve our members and partners, drive innovation, and contribute effectively to the achievement of the SDGs in Africa. Next, please. So quickly, these are uh, some uh, milestones of UCLG Africa roadmap. We have put in place our uh, UCLG Africa uh, e-academy, promoting uh, e-learning. Um, we have organized our uh, annual uh, hybrid forum uh, dedicated to digital transformation. Uh, we have also created the African Smart Cities Network during AfriCity 9 in Kisumu, uh, which is led by the city of Bengrir in Morocco. And we offer online training activities, webinars, MOOCs, online uh, executive master degree uh, in city management. Next, please. So uh, uh, I will quickly go uh, through our uh, e-learning platform. So as a part of our efforts, we, we have launched the e-academy ECLG Africa, and, uh, which aims to develop uh, and uh, adapt training offers to reach a large number of uh, beneficiaries and to reduce training costs. Uh, next, please. Next. Next. The e-academy caters uh, to various target uh, groups including uh, our members, national and regional associations, local and regional governments, elected officials, territorial managers, professional networks, our staff, and uh, training and capacity building institutes. Next, please. So uh, currently, the e-academy platform offers the uh, five pilot uh, courses developed by ALGA of uh, UCLG Africa. Uh, that courses cover topics such as uh, participatory budgeting, project management, territorial coaching, and we have also integrated modules on digital transformation and smart cities through our partnership with the IEEE Institute. Uh, next, please. Next. So uh, I will take this uh, opportunity uh, to announce that um, ECLG Africa, in partnership with the State Agency for Public Service Innovation, Azan of Azerbaijan, and the Moroccan Association of the President of Communal Council, IMPCC, will launch this week the UCLG Africa Azan MPCC Local Africa Public Service Award. This award uh, aims to recognize and celebrate innovative solutions best practices and initiatives implemented by African local and regional governments in decentralization, local governance, and territorial uh, development. So uh, finally, I will conclude with the next, please, uh, some uh, recommendation. Uh, so uh, we, we, we uh, recommend to integrate the toolkit into uh, UCLG Africa E-Academy to ensure that uh, digital government transformation becomes a fundamental component of our capacity building initiatives. Uh, we also propose collaborative efforts between uh, UCLG Africa, UNDESA, to develop and deliver tailored training, workshops, webinars, and peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. Uh, by joining our expertise, networks, and resources, we build the capacities of the local and regional governments in Africa, empowering them to drive and sustain a digital uh, transformation across uh, the region. So uh, in conclusion, uh, our organization is dedicated to advancing digital government transformation in Africa to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs and through our commitment to digitalization, capacity building and partnerships, we aim to build a smarter and more connecting Africa, leaving no one and no place behind. Uh, thank you.
Hey, Sarbeet, thank you very much for introducing UCLG Africa's vision and roadmap to become a smart Pan-African organization and the e-academy that you talked about uh, as the platform. I appreciate the suggestions that you mentioned and the advice to promote the toolkit for the training purpose of schools and institutes of African uh, administ uh, public administration in your network. Uh, this concludes the interactive discussion. I just want to uh, maybe mention, just take one more minute uh, keeping to mention three important points that I take away from the five distinguished panelists who just spoke. That this toolkit, number one is toolkit is foundational to develop capacity for digital transformation of governments, uh, including the methodology and the innovation uh, cases uh, that have come from uh, various regions uh, for inspiration. The second important point that I take away is that this toolkit will lead further localization and contextualization that uh, several of the speakers talked about uh, for mindset change, for skill development, also for partnerships. And the third important point is that the global trainer of trainers need to be developed. And these trainers could come from various regions and networks that you've been able to convene today and uh, could also create uh, opportunities and platforms for peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing. Also, I'd like to offer uh, one more action point uh, as using the moderator's prerogative, if I may, uh, that we can create incentive for experimentation using this toolkit, which I will take away in, in, in Bangladesh. And I will create that because we have uh, created a lot of experimentation possibilities with innovation fund and innovation awards, which other countries could also uh, uh, may, maybe may want to replicate. So I want to congratulate you and POC to develop this very necessary toolkit, very timely initiative, and also convene the global networks to adopt and promote it across the across the world. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Lizan uh, E. Parent uh, Kalina, uh, Dean of Development Academy of the Philippines and President of the Philippines Society for Public Administration to moderate the open discussion in the Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Lizan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you very much, Dr. Anir. Dear participants, I hope you have so far enjoyed the webinar. So again, I am the Dean of the Development Academy of the Philippines Graduate School and President of the Philippine Society for Public Administration. It is my honor to moderate this open discussion and Q&A session. So having heard the presentations earlier, I echoed with previous speakers that it is really important to enhance digital capacities of both government officials and capacity developers such as the AP and other educational institutions. We at the Development Academy of the Philippines also acknowledge that digital transformation could effectively strengthen government digital services to enhance productivity in the public sector. So before I open the floor to questions, I would like to invite two senior government officials from Azerbaijan and Papua New Guinea to make two short interventions as these two countries are moving aggressively and digital government transformation. First, I would like to invite Mr. Samuel Aliyev, Head of the Sign of Services and Innovations Department, State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations under the President Azerbaijan to deliver his short intervention. Mr. Aliyev, the floor is yours. Mr. Aliyev, we can't hear you yet. Thank you, Ms. Jizan, distinguished guests, experts. It's an honor to be here and have a chance to share our thoughts about digital transformation and our practice. Of course, we had success and some failures in this period. And uh, I'll try to give a brief information about the digital transformation policy and public service innovation in Azerbaijan, what we have done and what we are going to do. And we are the state agents for public service and social innovation under the president of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And we are as an optimization of public services in our country. And uh, we are known as Asan Service, as a global brand. Asan is not a, a, a local brand, it's known the global area. And uh, we started the government infrastructure development 20 years ago. And over the years, more than 500 electronic services have been made available to the citizens by state bodies. And the number of electronic service users is about 3 million. 
in our country. And uh, what we started 10 years ago, we started to simplify our government services. We created Asan Service Centers. Next slide, please. And Asan, uh, the directions of the Asan is the public services, innovations, and social projects. And uh, we took the old public services where we had some challenges and we optimized it, we simplified them, and then we do it back. And uh, like Asan is uh, one of the good example of optimization and simplification of public service delivery model in the world. And it's well known in the international area. Asan got United Nations Public Service Award in 2015 for the quality of services. And also this year, we got Best Government Services Award in the world. And it means that our model is uh, good to provide our citizens with uh, public services. Starting from 2018, the start state program on the transition to digital transformation was adopted in Azerbaijan. And uh, over the past five years, more than 50 digital projects have been developed. Please next slide, and uh, I will show our e-government infrastructure. We created our digital government infrastructure, based infrastructure, with our local tools. We have Assam Bridge. It's a good example of interoperability between the state agents, and now all state entities integrated to the system, and all data flows are they secure in our country by using Assam Bridge. And all ministers, state agents, and the citizens can use our the public services with an easy and comfort way. And all information is integrated to the Assam Bridge pool. Please, next slide. We, uh, it's a good example to uh, pass from one-stop shop model to the non-stop shop model. As I mentioned, Assam is a one-stop shop model, and it's uh, one of the best model in the vote for the fiscal services, but now we are passing to the non-stop shop model. Before the citizens came to the government to get public services, but now we are going from reactive services to the proactive services and the government goes to the citizens and government delivers to the, uh, the services to the citizens. Please, the next slide. And we created a personal cabinet of the citizens. My God, it's a, uh, where a citizen can get public services directly by his mobile phone or by the web platform and get smart notification about the services, about the all data about himself or herself. Also, citizen can give feedback to the state agents. Agents, please next slide. And uh, what we did before, we uh, registered all public services online and offline uh, services to the one platform. Now the number of entities is uh, 143 and the number of public services is more than 1,100. And uh, 550 electronic services we have. And uh, we evaluated all the services. Next slide, uh, I can show about our ASAN index asan assessment index it's a five stars rating system for all public services and we evaluate all services every year and then we can say that these services e-services or offline services are five star services or four stars and we announce all the results by using this asan assessment index we analyze all services and we decide where we can simplify the services next slide please as I mentioned, we have about 50 digital projects, and EVs is one of them. And we have the uh, simplest uh, visa system in the one in the world. And Asan Visa is you can get e visa in uh, less than three minutes and three hours to our country. And also, uh, we use uh, next slide. Uh, I can show what kind of frontier technologies we use to analyze to, to our data. We uh, use machine learning analysis uh, for, from the tourist reviews. When our tourists uh, return back to their countries, we send them survey. And then they, uh, from their feedbacks, our uh, machine learning algorithm analyze all feedbacks and 
give the smart decisions, smart opinions uh, about what we are, what good in our account and what's the negative uh, feedback we are. For example, you can see from the photos that, for example, pupil, staff, photo, uh, friendly, these are the positive feedbacks, but uh, you can see also some negative uh, feedbacks, including taxi and uh, airport and others. Please, the uh, uh, next slide. And this is also a good example of the digital uh, services as an appeal information systems where our citizens can participate in decision making and uh, problem solving. In any case, if our citizens came across from the, any problematic situation, he or she can uh, only take a video, uh, photo and a video and send to our Asan Appeal Information Systems, and uh, then the information in a second sent to the relevant organization and the system can follow all this process. Also, we have Asan uh, Finance System to make simple financial services to our citizens. For instance, before Asan Finance, citizens must collect mass of paper documents to get any financial services from banks or other financial institutions. But now by using a sound finance platform, banks get all data about the citizens in a second. Of course, uh, in the framework of digital transformation, we created, uh, we, had, we had some challenges. Uh, also, we have uh, data centers where with the tire three certificates and we have a state program for placing state data to the government fund. That's very important to have a digital transformation. We actively use digital signature biometric identification tools. We are preparing digital core, digital economy strategy, AI strategy for the countries, but we came some challenge in our country, especially linked with government officials. Uh, for example, lack of digital skills and knowledge, uh, especially in the regions, there are some difficulties. So uh, some government officials haven't the necessary digital skills and knowledge to effectively navigate the complexities of digital transformation. This includes understanding emerging technologies, data management, cybersecurity, and leveraging digital tools and platforms. In these directions, of course, uh, we are preparing some training programs for government officials and uh, for the community tour. And uh, I think it's the general problem in the countries that we have a digital gap between the big cities and the viewers. And we are trying to increase the digital awareness of our society, especially in the rural regions. We have digital volunteers and Ali, yeah. some training Sorry programs. To... Mr. Aliyev, sorry to interrupt you. Can you wrap up in one minute? Thank you. Okay. Okay. And uh, last, uh, what can I, uh, what I want to say? We have international relations. Of course, uh, we saw the uh, effectiveness of this process in the COVID nineteen period when all countries were looking for the best solutions, and uh, we created some online vaccine certification system, online monitoring system, and shared our practice with different countries. Next slide, uh, please just uh, would like to mention that we have a memorandum of understanding with 17 countries. We have a, uh, my uh, colleague, Ms. Uh, Ms. Amir mentioned that we have a UCLG, Africa and Assam uh, joint award for the uh, public services. And uh, why we do it, we want to improve our services. We want to share our success stories in digital transformation. And of course, uh, it's not possible without uh, with other countries, without their partnership with the international organization. Thank you for creating such opportunity for me to share my knowledge, my uh, practice. Thank you, Mr. Aliyev, for sharing your thoughts and insights on the success factors of digital government transformation and in Azerbaijan, as well, of course, the challenges you have faced and how you have addressed them. I also appreciate uh, your highlighting the importance of digital cooperation with other developing countries. Now, let me have the pleasure to invite Mr. Stephen Mat Matainaho, Secretary, Department of ICT, Papua New Guinea, to deliver his short intervention. Mr. Matainaho, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, I hope you all can hear me, uh, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Good Very morning. well. Thank you. Good morning and good evening. Um, I I do not have a presentation, but I will have a, uh, make a brief statement. Uh, it's an honor for me as the secretary of the Department of ICT in Papua New Guinea to address you all today at this capacity development webinar organized by UN POG in partnership with UN ISCAP. I'm very delighted to be part of this significant event that focuses on advancing digital government transformation for accelerating the implementations of the sustainable development goals. Allow me to just begin very briefly and shed light on the challenges Papua New Guinea has encountered in its journey towards digital government transformation. One of the historical primary hurdles we faced is the lack of coordination amongst various government entities involved in the digitalization process. Uh, lack of coordination has led to fragmented efforts and a slower pace of progress. Additionally, there's been a need for a champion of digital transformation within the government to drive and coordinate initiatives effectively. To address these challenges, Papua New Guinea commenced its journey as, as uh, early and late as 2019, undertaking several strategic approaches. We formulated the digital transformation policy in 2020, which provides a comprehensive framework to guide our digitalization efforts. This policy aims to create an enabling environment for digital government transformation by promoting innovation, enhancing digital skills, and improving service delivery to citizens. In 2022, recognizing the need for updated legislation to support digital transformation, we passed the Digital Government Act in 2022. This act of parliament established a solid legal foundation for implementation of digital government initiatives and ensures compliance with international standards and best practices. In addition, we have taken significant steps to bolster our cybersecurity capabilities by establishing a national cybersecurity center, a, a emergency response and an incident response team. This center plays a crucial role in safeguarding our public digital infrastructure. In the early part of this year, and more recently, we've rolled out the government private cloud, and we've also introduced a digital ID wallet conceptual framework as part of our government technology stack. These initiatives are aimed at improving efficiency, reducing duplication of efforts, and enhancing the security and accessibility of government services for our citizens. While these efforts we have reached, we recognize that digital transformation cannot be achieved in isolation, co collaboration and digital cooperation with uh, the global and, and also the Pacific community are paramount of paramount importance. The Pacific region shares common challenges and opportunities and together we can leverage strengths and resources to drive digital transformation in a coordinated and impactful manner. To this end, I would also highlight that the Pacific ICT ministers will be meeting in Port Mosby in Papua New Guinea on the 28th of August to discuss and agree on some of the collective ways forward. This meeting will serve as a platform to foster regional co collaboration, exchange knowledge, and identify areas of co cooperation within the Pacific community. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that Papua New Guinea is fully committed to embracing digital government transformation for the betterment of our nation and our people. We recognize the challenges we face, but we are determined to overcome them through strategic policy, legislative reforms, strengthening cybersecurity measures and implementation on, of innovation, innovative digital solutions. This toolkit being launched now serves as an important tool to validate existing approaches and assess additional interventions required to strengthen the digital government transformation efforts. I'm confident with continued collaboration and digital cooperation within the Pacific community and also with support of our key organizations, 
such as the UN POG and UN SCAP, we can unlock the full potential of digital transformation to accelerate achievement of the sustainable development goals and especially leaving no one behind. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matayan Naho, for your introduction about the challenges of digital governance transformation in PNG and your strategy to address them. I also appreciate your insights on the importance of digital cooperation in the Pacific community. Now I open the floor to our participants for any questions you may have for our speakers. So I'd like to uh, check our chat box if we have questions, please. All right, um, I think uh, I received a uh, few questions uh, here. Uh, the first one is um, in terms of e-government systems, what is uh, one best practice from your country that other countries can learn from? Maybe you can hear from our speakers. Um, yeah. Um, Mr. Stephen, can, can you share your thoughts on this? And from other speakers as well? The question again is, um, in terms of e-government systems, what is one best practice from your country that other countries can learn from? Uh, I think uh, there was a presentation earlier on um, I think it was from the ITU on the GovTech stack. And I think that is a good practice with uh, digital government building blocks that can be used um, uh, to build to build up um, your, your digital government uh, framework. And um, I think that's the best, uh, that's, been, that's been a good uh, 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 sharing experience from us by using that, as well as uh, there was a presentation from uh, Singapore on a GovTech stack. And I think those are good working um, uh, blocks to help you know, reduce duplication of investments and also effectively uh, roll out uh, digital services. All right, thank you for that, Mr. Stephen. I'd like also to get the comments of Mr. Son from Korea and uh, likewise from Mr. Uh, Song Yu Sui. Uh, from Mr. Son, please, thank you. Um, great, we have uh, many digital uh, government or e-government services in Korea. Um, but especially, I'd like to recommend that uh, we have a government uh, integrity portal, gov.kr, which is also uh, very famous because most of countries have their integrity portal for the citizens. Um, our government portal is different from um, other governments portal like gov.uk because we also have a separated uh, portal for the, each policy area. And our integrity portal works as a genuine portal to each uh, third party services. It works uh, better for citizens because we, they have uh, multiple ways to approach the services, not the single way, but that we provide multiple services um, uh, so people can select their own way uh, in, uh, the, in own, own their, their own best way to use the services. That's the, uh, I think that's a real citizen-centric approach, uh, not just uh, uh, providing just one way to access service, we provide mo multiple as much as possible we can. So that's our uh, basic concept. And that's why we also uh, developed other, like a, uh, in our print, my presentation, virtual, a system for citizens which use uh, private sector uh, apps for the service app, for the channel. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's really about citizen-centric approach again, which uh, lead us to the question, um, for whom is digital digital transformation? Thank you for that, Mr. Son. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Alex Brilliantes. Sir, please. This will be very quick, but uh, if they talk about uh, best practice, I've been to Asan. We're very happy that Mr. Semran of Aliyev is here. And if you look at what they've done in Azerbaijan, it's just incredible. More than 300 services under one roof, citizens participation, they train the people. And they were, as a matter of fact, uh, featured, they received the UN Public Service Awards. So it's really some, and I know that in the last committee of experts for public administration, they again presented that. So all of us around the room, we've always used ASAN 
as an example of a best practice. So I must commend Asan, I know uh, Dr. Abdul and all, but really uh, uh, my dream is to bring many officials to see what's, what you have done there and for us to really replicate that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that um, observation, Dr. Alex. And uh, yeah, um, again, I think for, for the last decade, we experienced and we observed that there are already more and improve uh, digital services uh, around the around the world and uh, we are learning from each other and the toolkit is a very useful um, reference actually for all countries so um, are there any questions um, otherwise um, we can conclude this open discussion or um, if um, yeah there are other comments Mr. Son would you like to to comment uh, on that? Or any other insights? Me again. For additional comments, is you mean the overall for about the CO nine toolkit? Yeah. Yeah, I think I I really agreed on the idea that the, the toolkit is very necessary for because the systematic approach is very important for. I, especially for developing countries. Um, the guidelines will be uh, play a very important role for in our project. So I, we, we, uh, we really happy, happy and I'm really glad to uh, provide more support and more, uh, more uh, participation regarding for the progress. And we hope to see the next version soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again for that. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude this open discussion and Q&A session. If you have any questions, you can leave it at the chat box and our organizers will address them. I know you have more questions, but uh, due to time limitation, I would now pass the floor to Mr. Yao. Mr. Yao, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. Um, dear participants, I hope you have uh, so far enjoyed the uh, the presentation and discussions from our uh, excellent speakers and uh, uh, our moderators also did a very very excellent job to uh, manage the whole process. Although we are going beyond a little bit time, but uh, we have very good high quality discussions. So now please allow me to invite Mr. Ki Chong Ko, head of UNPOC, uh, DPID UNDESA, to deliver his closing remarks with the key uh, recommendation and way forward. Mr. Ko, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, uh, people are uh, closing the mark. Uh, I'm really sorry. This webinar time management is not smoothly. Sorry. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your active engagement and keen interest in this webinar. I hope. You have enjoyed the discussions of the webinar on recent trends in digital government transformation from both national and international perspectives. I also hope this webinar has helped you develop a better understanding of the toolkit with regard to the importance of embracing of a holistic approach, setting up the strategy and roadmap developing capacities of government institutions and society in general, including changing mindsets and conducting continuous motivating and evaluation of the progress of digital government transformation. While a majority of countries have made remarkable progress in digital transformation, many developing countries and the people in vulnerable situations have been further left, left behind. In this regard, I would like to re-emphasize the digital government transformation should be inclusive and human-centered, which calls for developing capacities of people in vulnerable situations to promote digital inclusion as well as strengthening digital cooperation among countries. During the open discussion, we have heard many insights on the challenges and innovative approaches to digital government transformation from Azerbaijan, 
Papua New Guinea and other countries. Other session moderators from Singapore, Bangladesh, and the Philippines have also briefly touched upon their national experience of digital government transformation, which is helpful for promoting digital cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, I deeply appreciate the positive comments by representatives from APA, EROFA, APAM, and UCLG Africa on the timeliness and usefulness of the toolkit. I also highly value their recommendations and commitment to mainstream the toolkit in the curriculum of public administration schools or training institute in their network. As competitive developers, the educational institutions and the public administration schools could play an important role in enhancing the digital capacity of government institutions and the society in general. On the way forward, I hope this webinar could generate more capacity development interest from government institutions and public administration schools to adopt and implement, implement the toolkit to national context. I also hope this webinar could also result in the delivery of national training workshops upon government request. Please be assured, UNPOG, in partnership with UNSCAP, ITU, and other international organizations and a global network of schools of public administration, will continue to do our best to support developing countries in advancing digital government transformation. We look forward to your continued collaboration and engagement. Thank you all very much. And I hope you keep staying safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Call, for your insight. Uh, closing remarks with suggestion for uh, further mainstream and implementing the toolkit. Uh, with this, I would like to announce the closing of this webinar. And I thank you again for your active participation and a great support to our work. So before uh, you go, I would like uh, sincerely appreciate if you could uh, kindly uh, scan the QR code or use this URL to uh, give us your feedback uh, about this webinar. This is very important for us to further improve our work and also better to uh, solicit uh, your, your comments and also to garner your interests and uh, demands for uh, this uh, capacity the, uh, 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 request, yeah. Thank you all. And also I especially thank uh, our moderators the speakers yeah for your uh, for your kind uh, support and engagement and uh, dedication to support us yeah thank you so much thank you all thank you thank you congratulations thank you thank you, thank you alex thank you lizan thank you steven yeah. thank you goodbye Thank you, goodbye. Uh, yeah, please do help us figure out this way. Yeah, it's very important to us to employ work. Yeah.